new series. Uh, we close. I, I really li- don't like leaving series behind, but we have to. Uh, God is speaking. He's always speaking. He's always doing something new, so we don't like to camp uh, anywhere for very long. Uh, before we get into the message, for those of you who are visiting, we do this declaration as kind of a prayer to get our hearts ready to receive. We fully believe that every time we come together, God wants to do something fresh to our hearts because they need it. And so if uh, if you can just say this with me, say, today, Today. I will hear the voice of God God. through the word of God. God. My eyes will be enlightened enlightened. and I will be changed. changed. Now turn to your neighbor and tell, tell them I will be changed. Turn to another neighbor that you didn't turn to before and tell them I will be changed. All right, I want to jump right into this uh, particular uh, series. We're going to be unpacking the book of James. And the book of James is interesting because I remember when I, re- when I first began to read it early on, it just confronted so many things on the inside of me that I just didn't want to look at. In fact, and I, and I mean this, I wanted to rip that whole book out of the Bible at one time in my life. Anybody ever want to do that to a chapter in the Bible, Right. Because really, it, it, the Bible reads you, and it was reading me, and there were areas that I just didn't want to look at or confront because I, my, my walk with the Lord needed to grow because now I understand that when God is confronting me, it's because he wants me to be better. He wants to give me more blessings, more responsibility, and these areas need to be dealt with. And so uh, the book of James, uh, well, it starts off, like, actually, let's look at the, this opening scripture. It says, this letter is from James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm writing to the 12 tribes, Jewish believers scattered abroad. The book of James written by James. Who's James? James was the brother of Jesus. Interesting, he didn't even believe in Jesus when Jesus was doing his ministry. He believed in Jesus after he was resurrected, um, probably when he showed up, when he was still alive. Yep, I'd make a believer out of me. So uh, anyways, he was the leader of the Jerusalem church. And in this book, he's analyzing what is genuine faith. In other words, genuine faith, if it's genuine, should be expressed in the way that we live our lives, in the way that we treat others. And so he kind of dives into that. And, And notice how it says scattered abroad. The church was scattered at this time a lot, primarily because of persecution. And that word scattered got my attention because really the church today, I would even say globally, but even in the United States, is very scattered. Maybe not because of persecution, but we're scattered because of differences of beliefs and philosophies and opinions and doctrines. And so we're kind of scattered, don't you think? Yeah, so we got to just get back to what does the Bible have to say? And, um, And so something else about the book of James is that he's talking to, the, to his readers, those, all of these various churches, but he's coming from a basic foundation that it's kind of been lost. It's not really talked about throughout the whole church. These basic foundations, what I'm talking about, when he's talking to them, he's, he already understands that they know about man's dominion. Here's our next one, man's dominion. The, his audience, and we need to understand, that God created man to have dominion over the earth. In other words, to have stewardship. He gave humanity stewardship over the earth. Our earth is in the place that it is, how crazy it is, because of man's stewardship. Okay? He put us in control of this earth. Now, yes, Granted, the Bible says that Satan is the God of this world. He is the one who manipulates and deceives and causes people to do the things that they do. I'm wondering they don't even realize they're being led by him. But the the point is this. We have dominion over the earth. And we're not stewarding it very well. The other thing that they understood and that we need to understand, man's free will. God created humanity with a free will. He gave a choice. He wanted a creation that would willingly love him. And so he gave him the choice. You can either live your life depending on me, the tree of life, or you can live your life depending on you, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He doesn't, somehow we we have this understanding that God can tamper with the human will. He doesn't. And, and, I'll, and I think that sometimes we're selective. Yeah, we want our free, we want to be able to choose, but then there are other times we really don't want to choose. For example, uh, we, we, I don't know, you probably have had this thought, I've had this thought early on. Uh, anybody seen that, the movie The Shack? 
Okay, and you have this, uh, the, this really evil thing happen. This man abducts this child and ends up raping her and killing her, and it's a horrible thing. And, and so what happens when, when something like that, some kind of a tragedy like that happens, often we'll have this thought running through our brain, well, why did God allow that? Right? Well, why did God allow that? So what you're saying is, even though God made us with a free will and he's not going to change his mind and go back on that, we're wanting God to now interfere with that man's will and somehow change that man's will so that he doesn't do that, so there's not all these effects. Right? He let Adam choose. He didn't interfere with his free will, even though the effects was all this craziness of all humanity. Right? But there's a part of us that thinks he can tamper with a man's will. He doesn't. He gave man a free will to choose. He will not tamper with that. He wants to be freely chosen, freely depended on, not made to depend on. And so even when, the, uh, when James writes, he, he calls himself a slave of God. That word slave is a, in the Greek is actually bondservant. And a bondservant was, at one time, a per, he, was in, he, was, he was a slave to a family, but then his, this family, out of love, frees this slave. But because he loves his family and sees that he's way better off with this family than without that family, he becomes a bondservant. He gives up his freedom to be enslaved to this family, to be loved by this family. And so what, what James was saying, I'm a bondservant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even though I've been freed, no, I want to be enslaved to, to Jesus. I want to be married to Jesus. See, they understood something. I'm either going to be enslaved enslaved to God or I'm going to be enslaved to the enemy. There's not this middle place where I'm just enslaved to myself. And they, he, they understood this. In fact, it's interesting in Romans, it says this, don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? So whatever it is that you obey, guess what? It's leading you. It's enslaving you. That's called human nature. Okay. So the couple of other ethical laws uh, ethical laws bring order and blessing. This is another thing that they understood as a, a basic foundation. Ethical laws bring order and blessing. If I go against those ethical laws, I'm not going to be blessed. Really simple. It's not rocket science. Next one. The laws of sowing and reaping. They understood the laws of sowing and reaping. And here's the last one. They understood that God is good. He doesn't do bad. And this is the elephant that we're going to confront in the church today. Because have you ever been in a service where someone says, God is good. And what do the people say? All the time. And then the preacher says, all the time. And the people say, God is good. Right? How many of you at one time, maybe even this morning, said in your, in your brain, I don't know if he's good all the time. I mean, COVID wasn't really good. Irma wasn't really good. My husband dying and leaving my three children, oh, that wasn't too good. So what we're saying is that somehow he had something to do with it. Come on now. And so then, ah, that's what we're going to settle. Is he good all the time? Is he good all the time. He, and that's why I love in James, he jumps right into it. He says this, whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God, our Father, who created all the lights in the heavens. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. Jesus said, I've come to give you life and a life that's full and abundant, but it's the thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. You're going to have to settle this once and for all that God is good all the time. And in your notes, if we don't believe this, if we don't believe that God is good all the time, we will not fully surrender every area of our lives. We'll hold back an area of our lives. Think about Adam and Eve. Really, that, that was really the deception. Really, and the enemy was... was Casting that idea that God is not good all the time. Did God really say that you can't eat from that tree? 
He knows that you're going to be just like him if you eat of it. He knows that you, maybe he's just not good all the time. Maybe he's withholding something from you. If we don't settle this issue, we won't surrender. We won't be able to trust fully. Because there's going to be many times things are going to look like, what's going on? And we're going to have to land with God is good all the time. You know, I had, a, I had this friend who, this is in college, who had been abused by his, uh, both of his parents, and he ended up being placed in this, I don't know if it was a foster care situation, but this wonderful couple raised him, gave him a beautiful um, life, and sent him to college, and um, just, I, I met them, they were a wonderful family, but he couldn't, he, in the conversations I would have with him, he would say, I just don't know why God allowed that. And then he would say, where was God? And I remember thinking to myself, where was God? You, you got raised with this wonderful couple, and, and, and you went to college, and your whole life has been turned around. Where was God? God? It looks like God really turned that around for good, right? But he had that, couldn't God do something? Couldn't he just jump in and change their will? No, he doesn't interfere with the will of man. So here's another one. If we don't believe that God is good all the time, our perspective of the scriptures will be misconstrued. We won't be able to see the scriptures through God's perspective. We need to have the right perspective. Now, in the church, um, there's typically two thoughts that have been running rampant in the church. Um, two, I, uh, I guess, foundations of doctrine. One is called Calvinism. I'm not going to go through all of the points of Calvinism, but in a nutshell, this thought, this idea about God, and it's, and it's in pulpits all over the United States and, and all over the world, actually, that God's will is the final cause of all things, both good and bad. So, in other words, like what I said about in the shack, how this, dog, that this young girl was uh, kidnapped and then raped and then killed so in Calvinistic thinking, well, somehow, you know, that was God's will. And most have been raised under that kind of a doctrine. I can't serve a God like that, personally. I just can't, okay? But then there's this other doctrine that's called Arminianism. And, and Arminianism says that God has limited control in correspondence with man's freedom and response. In other words, you got to take into to uh, consideration, God made man with a free will. So the first one, Calvin, doesn't even take that into consideration. Like, you have nothing to do with anything. Well, then why pray? Let, let, let's just hang out until Christ returns. You know what I mean? So, no, but with Arminianism, you have a part to play. And so, uh, with that in mind, we look at now the next portion of Scripture in James, where he's going to begin to talk about trouble and trials, and then later he's going to talk about temptations, and he says this, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind, when you encounter some kind of a trouble, some kind of a situation. I'm going to read right from my notes because I have all the Greek words in here. Um, consider or look at it this way. It's an opportunity for great joy. And I had a hard time thinking about that when I first was reading James until I began to grow in some things. Opportunity. I never see, I never see joy when I think, think of a trial. It's not that the trial we're excited about. It's about what, what, what's going to come out. In other words, the results of that trouble is what we're excited about. We're excited that something great's going to come out of it. For you know that when your faith is tested, when your believing in God is tested, when your believing in his word is tested, when whether or not you're going to depend on God is being tested when the strength of your relationship with God is being tested. Are you following me? Your endurance, which means your ability to remain constant in the middle of a storm, has a chance to grow. Endurance is supposed to grow. It has a chance to grow. You don't need endurance in heaven. It's for right here on earth. Your, your endurance has a chance to grow, so let it grow. 
For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. That does not mean sinless or you never make mistakes. It simply means you're going to be mature. You're going to be able to handle God's blessing and steward it well. Complete, lacking nothing, no longer letting life leading you, no longer walking around with condemnation and shame, but bold and confident, being mature, lacking nothing. Now, that, I, that testing of faith, it's a Greek word. It's called dokimos, and it carries the idea of proving if something is genuine. So a lot of us are familiar with taking tests in high school and universities, right? Some people are really good test takers, and some people aren't. But typically, a test, or maybe even if, if you're uh, in, a, in, a, uh, you're in a, a place of employment, a lot of times they'll take you through testing because they want to see, do you know this stuff? Is this stuff in you? Why? Because if it's really in you and you know this stuff, now you can be promoted to your next level because now you can handle it, right? So tests often indicate promotion. God's always wanting to promote us to our next level. But we need to see what we're made of. God doesn't need to see it. We do. Okay? And so I, I remember when I first saw this scripture, mature, complete, lacking nothing. I was like, yeah, that's what I want. Right? So, but you, so you have your life, and we, we want to be at this place of lacking nothing. But in between your life and lacking nothing is called trouble and trials. It's called all kinds of stuff. Right? It's called living in this world. And so the way that we navigate, the way that we navigate the troubles and the trials and the tests that come our way really determines if we're going to be mature, lacking nothing, and complete. Are you following me? Okay, so in your notes, your, your next feeling is that life is a trial. Life is a trial. Why? Because this world is fallen is being manipulated and maligned by, by the enemy. Jesus called Satan the God of this world. So because it is fallen, listen, God does not have to set up opportunities. There's plenty all around us every single day. Life is the trial. Some trials we encounter, like, you know, you, you go into work and all of a sudden they're closing the doors that day. You're in a big trial, right? Or maybe, like for me, one day I woke up 16 and a half years old with uh, uh, the, the worst case of bronchial asthma. I couldn't breathe. So you encounter them. Irma, COVID, we encounter them. Are you following me? So now there's others that are a result of prayerlessness. A lot of times we walk into trouble simply because we're just so, so busy. Jesus said, watch and pray. Be vigilant that you don't enter into temptations. You don't enter into stuff that you really don't need to enter into because you're just so busy and you're not taking time to get some strategies to be strengthened for whatever's up ahead. Some we create. Anybody in here ever create some, created some trouble in your life? <laughs> so I remember when, when I was in college, um, there was this young man that was pursuing me and the Lord told me, do not date him. Do not enter into that relationship. Well, the day came that he, he asked me, he said, you know, um, I, 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 want to, I want to enter this dating season. I really believe that, you know, this is God. And so, and, and I'm hearing God say, no, no, no. What did I say? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> right? Several months later, he broke my heart. It took me a year to get over that. So I created that trouble. God had nothing to do with that. All right, that was all me, not taking those promptings from the Lord. And so a lot of times God will show us things in the Word to do, and then we just don't do them. And guess what? All of a sudden we're in all kinds of trials, okay, simply because we didn't do it. So some we create unwittingly, like we don't even realize we did it. The other day I, I walked out into the garage and, um, and I came back in, and I thought that I closed the door that goes into our house from the garage. And I guess I didn't. I thought I did. So it was wide open. I was letting all kinds of stuff in the house. And my husband made sure that he let me know. <laughs> right? So unwittingly, unwittingly, we create stuff in our lives. The point is, trials are not sent from God to make you better. They're not. 
They're not sent to make you better. They're a part of this fallen world. And um, uh, trials do, however, they do reveal what is going on in our heart. It tests whether or not our relationship, our dependency on God is where it needs to be. And again, God allows all of the trouble because he gave this earth stewardship to man and he gave us a free will. However, trials, they are opportunities to depend on God. They're opportunities. My mom used to say to me, oh, a miracle begins with a problem. We want the miracle, but we don't want the problem, right? Or I've heard it said that there's no testimony without the test. So it's an opportunity to depend on this God who loves us so much, who has such good in store for us, who has a plan and a purpose for our life. I want you to look at the scripture. This is the Apostle Paul. He wrote most of the New Testament. He says, we think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure, and we thought we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die. I mean, he's going through it. Can you not see that? But as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves. We just stopped trying to figure it out and do it on our own strength. And we learned to rely only on God who raises the dead, God who can turn it around because that's what he does. He's a supernatural God. So he had to learn to depend on God. So trouble, trials, is an opportunity to depend on God. So when we're in a trial, he continues, it's interesting. So, we're in, in, so when we enter a trouble or trial of some kind, it's not the time to start saying, well, God, why is this happening? That's such a waste of time. Don't go there. Instead, ask, what, God? What do you need me to do? What do I need to pray? What is your wisdom in this situation? And this is what he says in James he says, if you need wisdom, you're in the middle of a trial. You definitely need wisdom, right? If you need wisdom, ask our generous God, and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking, well, you should have known better. No, that's not God. He doesn't do that, okay? But when you ask him, be sure that your faith, your dependency is in God alone. Don't vacillate. Like, be all in. Be fully surrendered, fully dependent on him. Do not waver for a person with a divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and and the world, or God, and, and coming up with my own solutions, and they are unstable in everything that they do. And, and I think that a lot of us have been there. God, I trust you. Yes, it's going to work out. And then you get some, some news that got actually worse. Oh, God, I don't know what I'm going to do, right? We go back and forth. You know, is he going to do something? Is he not going to? Is he going to do something? Is he not going to do something, right? We're laughing because we've all been there. Okay. So I love it how See, the word reads us. It shows us. I've often said that, that it reveals what's grown or not grown on the inside of me. And God's always wanting to make us better and stronger. You know, when I began reading the book of James, I had no idea. Uh, and this is years ago. I, I had no idea the level of pride that was working in my life. And when I was in the book of James, all I could see was all of the pride that was, because you know, sometimes you, you think when you live right, you know, I'm not drinking or, or doing drugs and I'm, I'm keeping myself pure, so I'm good with God. So there's like a, a religious pride, right? Oh, but I had all kinds of yuck, yuck on the inside. How I viewed people and the jealousies and the offense and the unforgiveness and putting myself forward. Oh, I forgot all that stuff. But I began to see that that, that is the old nature that's supposed to be transformed to be like God. And so when you look at the book of James, it confronts ooh, all kinds of stuff. So let's, cut, let's just go confront some more things in us, okay? Let's go good. So 
in your notes, the strength of the relationship that we have with God determines the effects of the trial. So when I entered a, a horrible trial, 2002, I lost my husband to cancer, my first husband, and I entered a horrible trouble, okay? And in that trouble, in that trial, I was depending on God. I was going into his presence. I was worshiping. I was in his word. And I really didn't feel anything but absolute grief. But I continued to go where I knew my healing needed to come from. I depended on God in that trial, in that trouble. I didn't blame him. I didn't get angry at him. I understood all of these things about dominion and man's free will. So, but notice this. My relationship with God determined the effects of that trial. Grow Church is an effect of that trial. Hello. <laughs> Being married to the most amazing man on planet Earth is an effect of that trial. And I mean it, right? If I didn't walk through that with God, depending on God, I wouldn't have grown. I wouldn't have been able to pastor this church. So the strength of the relationship determines the effect of the trial. So now he moves into talking about, he, he talked about tests and, and trials. Now he's going to start talking about temptations. And he begins this section off by saying, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, and that's, again, that's that consistent. You, you, you remain constant in the, in the middle of a storm when he's withstood that test, having uh, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. And oftentimes when we see the crown of life, we think, oh, I'm going to be blessed when I get to eternity. That's not what he's saying, the crown of life, meaning you're going to reign in that area of your life. You're going to receive something right now when you're in earth. There's something that you're going to visibly experience in your life that's good. You're going to reign in an area of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When tempted, when tempted, I'm going to read this from my notes because I have all of my little Greek here. For when one is tempted, no one should say God is tempting me for God cannot. God cannot be tempted by evil. And nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they're dragged away by their own evil desire. And if you were to unpack that in the Greek, it simply means you were dragged away. You desired something that was forbidden, something that you know it's really not good for you. It's not going to make you any better. It's not life-giving. It's not even a part of your design. You desired something that was forbidden, and you became enticed. You became trapped. Then after the desire has conceived, it's made you a prisoner. It gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, it gives birth to death. In your notes, temptations, temptations will often arise from within. So you're in the middle of a, of a trial of some, some kind of a trouble, some kind of a, a, a difficult situation. That's when the, the enemy comes in to, to try to tempt us. It has nothing to do with God. They come from the pit of hell. God will never tempt you to sin. Here's another one. Temptations are designed to destroy our lives. God has never wanted to destroy your life. He's always wanting to promote you. Always wanting to bless. And here's the next one. God gives the way of escape. He'll always, in the middle of that temptation, he will give you a way of escape. I don't know. I just don't think we're always taking it. <clears throat> the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you're tempted, more than you can say, so when you're tempted, he's going to show you a way out so you can endure it. He's going to show you a way out. So he's going to show you some kind of an escape route. What is that, some, what is that escape route? Well, maybe if you're a person, boy, you, you're just struggling with uh, some kind of a, uh, with pornography. Well, he's going to give you a way of escape. He's going to reveal you, put some controls on your computer, get an accountability person that's going to be able to know when you're struggling so that you can escape that temptation. 
He's going to show you a way of escape. He's going to put you in, you know, you're going to enter a small group and you're going to have people around you that are going to be there for you that when you want to go out and party with your friends and, and do something so destructive like drive drunk and kill yourself, no, you've got this now, this way of escape, this small group, this people that are going to hold you accountable and keep you safe. Maybe God is giving us a way of escape, but maybe we're just not taking it. Oh, come on now. <laughs> I had someone say to me, you know, gosh, I just want to always shout in your services. I says, well, then shout. Go ahead. Say amen. Yeah, get into it. It helps. It really helps. Okay. I will not pull a bishop today. So, um, okay. Then he goes on in James. He says this. So don't be misled, my dear brothers and sisters. Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father, who created all the lights in the heavens. He never changes or casts the shipping shadow. All of that temptation, it's not coming from God, because God can only do good. So where do I land? I'm in the middle of this trouble. I'm in the middle of this trial. It's so clear in the scriptures. He says this in James. He continues. Oh, go here. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must be quick to listen in the middle of a trouble, in the middle of a temptation. Be quick to listen. Quick to listen, not flap your gums. Quick to listen. God, what are you saying? God, what are you saying? Not, oh my gosh. No, God, what are you saying? Quick to listen. Slow to speak and slow to get angry. Boy, I remember reading that the first time and saying, oh, Father. <laughs> Anybody with me? Okay. Slow to speak, slow to get angry. See, when you're angry, when we get angry, the root of anger is rejection. It really is. We're not getting my mind. Don't you get this, right? Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. Nothing good can come out of being angry. It's all a sign that we're depending on ourselves instead of depending on God. That should have been a big amen. And it goes on to say, so get rid of all the filth and the evil in your lives. Humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts, for it, it is that word that you're planting in your hearts. That word has the power. It's miraculous to save your souls, your mind, your will, and your emotions. It's only the word of God that can literally begin to transform that soul. But what got my attention was it says, it doesn't say accept the word of God. It says humbly accept the word of God. In other words, don't go to the word that's designed to read you, that's designed to change you. Don't go to the word with your mind made up. Don't open up the scriptures looking for scriptures to support your point of view. Open up the scriptures with fresh eyes. God, transform me today. Grow me today. Align me today with your will through your word. Fresh eyes. Humble ourselves under God's mighty hand, the word says, and in due time, he'll exalt us. So in your notes, humbly accept God's transforming word. His word can supernaturally transform you. He, then he goes on to say, he continues in the same thought line, but don't just listen to God's word. Just don't, don't read it. Oh, I read my word. Check it off my list. Oh, I did my thing. No, 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 no. Don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Wait, what? Do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word, you just kind of read it and don't obey it. It's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, you walk away, and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law, the perfect word, 
that sets you free. It has the potential to set you free. It has the potential to turn you from a very timid, insecure, fearful person to a very bold, confident person. It can set you free. It can transform you. But you got to look carefully at it. It means you've got to look at it with fresh eyes. Open. God, read me today. If you're only hearing everything that you do so well before God, you're not hearing God. Because his word well, oh, I gotta, oh, I haven't been doing that. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Right? So in your notes, daily plant the word. Daily, daily. Determine to do what it says. Daily, daily open up the scriptures. It's God speaking to you. Have a paper ready, get a pen ready, and, and just go before. I just believe God. You're going to speak to me. We have on our website, it's called our SOAP reading plan, where the church, we're doing this together every day. Let God read you. Let God speak to you. Let him transform another part of your soul that you're not even aware needs to be transformed. Every single day until we see him face to face, he's going to be transforming us if we let him, if we let him. Interesting, we often say the scripture in Romans chapter 8, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God. That means agape God, love God unconditionally. I'm fully dependent on you, God, and are called according to his purpose. See, that scripture, you really can't look at that scripture unless we're actually hearing the word and doing the word. It's because when I'm in a trial, and I'm depending on him, I'm hearing and I'm doing his word, now he can supernaturally turn it around for good. It's when somehow I'm engaging with him. So there's a, you're in a trial, a financial crisis, right? We're going to depend on God. So if I'm going to depend on God, I'm going to do his word. I'm going to continue to sow and to tithe, even though I'm in the middle of a financial crisis. Because when I'm tithing, I'm depending on God. Now he can turn that situation around for good. And so I'm in the middle, 2002, the death of my husband. I'm in the middle of a trial. So what did I do? I looked into the Word and I began, you know, you, you see patterns in the Word of how people dealt with tr tremendous trials in their life. You've got Paul and Silas. They just had their backs ripped open with a, 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 a beating of rods and they're in some prison. And so what do they do in the middle of their trouble? They began to praise and to worship. Right? As they praised and worshiped, what? As they were depending on God. That God, why did you allow this? I was doing something good for you. No, they, they, they praised and they worshiped. And then that place was shaken. And it got turned around for good. Right? And so here, you got Jesus. He's sleeping in a boat. All of a sudden, this squall arises, the word of God says. What did he do in the middle of that trouble? He spoke to the storm. So it's when we're hearing and we're doing, we're doing the things that the word of God says for us to do for our good. Now he can turn it around for good. Because in your notes, in your notes, doing the word releases power and blessing. Doing it. And listen, if we don't, if we're reading the word and we agree with that word, but we don't do it, we fool ourselves. We actually think that we're doing it, even though we're not doing it. We've got to do what it says, even if it doesn't make sense. I tell you, it didn't make sense to me to, you know, when the Bible says to bless your enemies. No, kill them, right? It says to pray for them. I'm not going to pray for them. <laughs> Come on. Then you want God to turn some relationship around and you can't even pray for your enemy. Oh, that wasn't planned. <laughs> okay, let's continue. James, the last part of James here. If you claim to be religious, but don't control your tongue, blah, 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 blah. Right? You're fooling yourself. 
you're deceived, you're being misled, misguided, God's not leading you, and your religion is worthless. Pure, genuine, genuine faith. Genuine religion in the sight of God, the Father, means caring for orphans and widows in their distress. So caring for those who are marginalized, not just living your own little life, but thinking outside of yourself to make a difference in the lives of people, right? And, and refusing to let the world corrupt you. In other words, I'm going to live the way God wants me to live, representing him. You see two things there. I reach out and I care for the marginalized, but at the same time, I'm living representing who he is because see the book of James was was looking and analyzing genuine faith genuine faith is both you're caring for people you're not just living for yourself but you you have this idea I want to live for him I want my life to represent his righteous standard and you don't do that in your strength you do that with the help of God this scripture really I believe ties it all together it's in Psalm it says, the Lord is a shelter for the oppressed. He's a refuge in times of trouble. Oh, he's a refuge. God, I can turn to you in the middle of this trouble. You didn't send it. You had nothing to do with it. Those who know your name, that word know, oh, it's yada. Those who have an intimate awareness of what your name means. Those who know your name, I, there's all kinds of words and scriptures that depict the names of God. See, I know the name of Jesus. See, the scripture says that he's Jehovah Jireh. He's my provider. I know that name. I know his name, that he's healer. I know that he's that my banner of victory. I know that he's my deliverer. I know his name, I'm intimately acquainted with him. That's all God ever wanted. That's all he ever wanted. That we would know him personally, individually, not what someone else said about him. That we would have our own in divine encounters with him. Oh, he hungers for that. He loves you so much. Those who know your name trust in you. How can you trust what you don't know? How can we truly trust him if we don't know his word? His word is his nature. His word depicts what he's like. When I began to understand that, I became a ferocious reader and meditator of the word. I need to know you. I want to know what you've made available for me. I want to know who you are because I found out that the more I know who you are, I find out who I am. The more I know you, who I can now trust you. I can really depend on you and not myself. I was created to depend on him not to depend on Tracy. And every day I have a choice. I can eat it from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I can depend on me or I can eat from the tree of life. I can depend on God who loved me and died for me. Look at this. Those who know your name trust in you for you, oh Lord. Do not abandon those who search for you. Those of you who are going through a trouble and you're going after God, you're not going to be abandoned. He's going to turn it around for good. Is God good all the time? Yes. And God wants you to know that about him. There's so many of you I saw when I was in prayer levels, levels of doctrines in your soul that have been laid there. That just hearing this the first time, oh, you're so challenged. The Holy Spirit wants to solidify that in you. And this is my challenge to you. You go home, get into the presence of God. Let him solidify this specific word in you. 
it's going to make all the difference in your life. You're going to be able to fully surrender every area of your life. Because that's what we do. We're kind of selective over the areas we're going to surrender to God based on what we know of God. But God wants all of you. And you will not experience the fullness of your destiny and his plan for your life unless there's full surrender. We can't fully surrender unless we really believe he's good all the time. Let's pray. Every head bowed, every eye closed. In the last part of the service, you may be visiting for the first time and maybe you've known religion. You've known about, well, it's a good thing to care for people. And that's awesome that you may know that. But the question I have, do you know Jesus? Is he your savior? Is he your Lord? The scripture that says that the word has the ability to transform your souls, it works for those who are already in the family. They've already yielded their heart to Jesus. And I want to give you an opportunity. You who have never asked Jesus, his spirit, to come to dwell on the inside of you. Your spirit at one time was connected to God. But Adam, he chose, he chose the wrong thing. And in that, it released sin into the human nature. Everybody has to come to the place where they recognize I'm a sinner and I need God to save my soul, to save my spirit. And if that's you today, you're here and you're, you're ready to surrender your life fully to Jesus, receive him into your heart, experience the greatest miracle of transformation. I want to pray with you. So if you want to be included in that prayer, with every head bowed, every head closed, quickly raise your hand and say, that's me. I need Jesus. I want him in my heart. I want to pray that prayer. Bless you all over this place. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Bless you. I want to receive Jesus. I want to be born anew. I want to be in the family of God. Awesome. You can put your hands down. Maybe you're here at one time, you prayed that prayer. You ask Jesus to come in your heart, and you know that he's your Savior. But you're living in such a way that he really is not Lord. You're still living, depending on you, doing things your way. And the Spirit of God is wooing you right now. He's touching you. You know, I need to fully give my every area of my life to him. You see, God has a plan for your life, and it's so good. And he needs your cooperation to fulfill it. And without your cooperation, you won't fulfill your destiny. And his plan for you is so good. You'll be so satisfied with his plan. So if that's you and you're, you're here, you want to recommit your life, you want him to be the Lord of your life, not just your Savior, but your Lord. All over this place, quickly raise your hand. Raise your hand. Say, that's me. Bless you, bless you all over this place, all over this place. Excellent. You can put your hands down. We're going to pray. What I want you to do is just repeat it after me, this prayer. Mean it with all your heart. And in that, in that prayer, you're releasing God to move in your heart and in your soul. Say, Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I believe that you died on the cross bearing my sin. You did that for me simply because you loved me. I ask you to come into my heart. Be my Savior and be my Lord. And I believe with this prayer, I'm a child of God. You're in my heart. Help me to live for you all the days of my life. Amen. I want to continue to pray. Father, I thank you right now for every person who's recommitting their heart to you. Help them by your spirit to not receive the shame, the condemnation, but just help them to see that you love them and you want to get right back and run with them the purpose and the plan that you have for them. In the name of Jesus, I thank you, God, that in this holy moment, you are healing, transforming, readjusting, realigning, setting us up for great success. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on and give God praise.